you're needing a great coffee to go into the backcountry or places you can't take a typical coffee maker, consider CS Instant Coffee. Use the code ADVENTURE at checkout at csinstant.coffee for 20% off. And Athletic Brewing, the makers of the only non-alcoholic craft beer geared towards helping adventure athletes stay in shape. Giving athletes the ability to train hard and still feel good about enjoying a tasty craft beer after a long training session. Use the code ADVENTURE at checkout for 15% off. I think that my sense of being sort of tired of the stuff that was out there and like trying to create something fresh sort of maybe grabbed a few people. And, you know, when you see that come through your feed, maybe you do pause as opposed to photos of lattes or whatever we're looking at on a daily basis. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, trying to help you find adventure every day in any stage of life. You're going to hear from explorers, adventurers, business owners, and anyone living their life a little more out of the box than usual. Hey, y'all. Today we're interviewing Brendan Leonard. Uh, he is the founder of the website semirad.com, which is S E M I dash R A D.com. It's basically a website for folks who, who love the outdoors, love adventure, um, but, but aren't, you know, professionals. We're not, you know, all out all the time. We love our sport and we love doing what we're doing, but we're not taking ourselves too seriously. And uh, he, he's a humorist, um, blogger, and uh, yeah, he, he's also a very well-known author. He's written a number of books, one that just came out on August 1st, which is uh, Bears Don't Care About Your Problems. It's basically a collection of his 80 best blog posts put together. Highly recommend checking it out. Link for it's in the show notes. Um, but Brendan has been featured in Backpacker, National Geographic, The Adventure Journal, Outside, Men's Journal, Sierra, etc. Just tons and tons of publications all over the place. Today, we're just kind of hearing his story about um, what, it, what it's been like to pursue a career as a creator in the outdoor and adventure space. I found him through his Instagram, where he posts a bunch of like illustrations, cartoons, basically, that he draws uh, that are you know humorous or making some point. It, it, it's really good stuff in all the garbage that social media can be. Brendan's stuff is, is really creative and entertaining. Highly recommend you checking him out. So yeah, I, ho I hope you enjoy the interview, and uh, I'm going to the mountains this weekend. Get out of all this mess we call the city. Talk to you on Monday. Could you tell us about like you know your background, um, where were you born, where were you raised, and how you ended up here? Yeah, I uh, I was born and raised in uh, Iowa, in small towns in Iowa, uh, a couple different ones, and um, moved out to Montana to get a master's degree in journalism in 2002, and then uh, never never went back to the Midwest, uh, To never moved back to the Midwest. Um, Steve did like a year in Arizona and Phoenix, and then have lived in Denver off and on since 2005. Um, minus minus three years where I lived in a van and was kind of all over the West. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good spot. You know, as you know, it's a nice combination of uh, being able to go to the mountains pretty quickly and then also being able to get Ethiopian food, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. My wife's a teacher here in Denver and I think her, her class has like nine or 10 languages in one class. Oh, wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, man. So, I mean, Denver is a great location. And and you said, you know, you, you moved out to Montana and first had that uh, kind of eye-opening experience. I mean, what was that like? You, I, I assume it was the mountains just blew your mind. Did you ever get to experience that as a kid growing up in Iowa? Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like most of what, what my book, 60 Meters to Anywhere, is about. Um, I, I went to, had to go to rehab for uh, alcohol uh, abuse uh, when I was 23. So that was the summer before I moved to Montana and they, they took <clears throat> their journalism program, took people without, with undergrad degrees in other, uh, disciplines. So it was, I had a marketing degree that I barely graduated with. So they took me and yeah, I was like, it was probably my first year there was probably the loneliest 
hardest year of my life, but I was able to get out just a handful of times into the, into the mountains and was really searching for something to, um, I guess, I guess, you know, like they tell you what you can't do when you're in, when you're in, uh, like treatment, uh, they don't really say, here's what you can do. Um, which is, I, I hadn't read very many books about what people do when they're, once they quit drinking and, uh, how to deal with addiction after that. And I just found the mountains to be like, wow, this is like a completely different life slash identity. Um, this is a thing I can do. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And from there I just kind of did started hiking, started doing a little backpacking and then got into climbing when I moved to Arizona and then, um, yeah. And then it was just kind of in love from there. I guess in a way it kind of felt, filled that void for you. Yeah, I guess so. Was it hard to stay off the alcohol? Yeah, I mean, at first it's like really difficult uh, because you don't really know because everyone around you, it's America, is like drinking for many, many reasons. You know, it's like everybody can have a beer at happy hour. You just like you don't really want to go to happy hour because you don't really like to drink one beer. Um, So yeah, it's it's interesting for sure. Um, But it's yeah, I wrote a couple hundred pages about it, so uh, it's, it's difficult, but yeah, if you have something else, I think it really helps fill that. So you're not just feeling like you're sitting around doing nothing, watching your life go by, I guess. Uh, I mean, is it hard for you to just continue revisiting that? Do a lot of people bring it up with interviews and stuff like this? No, it's, I mean, by now it's like, it's been 16, 17 years. It's about a drink. So yeah, it's been quite a while. So it's, uh, no, it's just like, like I've, written extensively about it so i've sort of like done with that not done with it but yeah it's it's out there already i guess yeah that come from a family played with it as well um Mm. my father well the day he found out my mom was pregnant with me he had a beer in his hand and he set it down on the coffee table and he hasn't touched one since Wow. Uh, he's like, I got to get my life together. <laughs> yeah. Good for him. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm super proud of him. Very, very proud of him. And I, I can't imagine, you know, it'd be a totally different life if he wouldn't have made that decision. Yeah. Or maybe you wouldn't know him at all. You know? Yeah. Like I don't know. Who knows where it would yeah. have taken him. It wasn't a good place. Yeah. It's funny. It works for some people and some people it doesn't work for it at all. So yeah, I know <laughs> like, it. But uh... he does and he drinks in a pretty regular, which I don't know. And I think I know that can be a slippery slope for some, for him, it seems to keep him kind of on that straight and narrow. Yeah. I mean, beer's an acquired taste, you know, like everything is whiskey, coffee, you know, and just like, like I drink a ton of coffee, but I'm in it for the drugs, you know, like, <laughs> I think like and I've had, I've had like two NA beers in my life. And I'm like, oh, I just, I don't know. I might as well just drink water at this point. But yeah. Yeah. It, it, if you don't like, yeah, that's what it is. He likes the taste, but if you don't like the taste, there's just, there's just not a whole lot yeah. of reason to drink beer. No. Yeah. Yeah. Other whatever whatever works, man. Yeah. Man. So you, you mentioned moving around a lot and, you know, I know you lived in a van for a while. Um, just, you know, what, what was that experience like? Is that something you think that's something every young person needs to go through before finding a place that they like to settle down, like having this experience of complete and utter freedom. Oh man. If you're, if you're that lucky and you can actually pull it off. Yeah. But I mean, I, mine was sort of a convergence of being able, a job where I could work from the road and then yeah, like a breakup I like took off and um, so it worked out. But I think, it's a cool way to see the country, but to, to be honest, before I did that, I had been, you know, traveling across the U S across the Western U S just on my own. Like I had a job where I had three full weeks off a year. Um, they just shut the, it was a nonprofit. So I wasn't making very much money, but they would shut the nonprofit down for, uh, a week at during the holidays and then a week in the fall and then a week in the spring. And then we had, we worked the whole summer. So, and then during the summer, I would be sent away for a week to go backpacking with uh, inner city youth. Uh, and so I had these two big, you know, seven day chunks. Well, nine days if you count the weekend on each end to work with. So I would, you know, be in my my car packed and be like, "Man, I'm gone. I'm out of here," and take off. Um, and we we had a little vacation on top of that too. So it was, I had been all over, you know, to the Grand Canyon a couple times and all over Utah and Wyoming. <clears throat> and 
uh, had, you know, spent a little time in Montana. So really got to see the West through a lot of just the freedom that job allowed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it's rad to be, to go live in a van. I don't think at the time that was the end of the end, uh, goal for me was to live in a van because I don't know if it is for anybody. Like once you get into it for a while, you're kind of like, wow, this is fun, but geez, it kind of sucks in a lot of ways. Um, but it is really, I mean, what a cool way to be able to see the country. You're like, you, if you can find free places to park your van <clears throat> and you can find a place to shower every once in a while, um, you are able to take in like so many vacations worth of, uh, of sites and places and people in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And yeah, if you can do it, it's amazing, but I think you can do, you can do a lot with two weeks, you know, what, which most people have for vacation, you know, or even a week, you know? Um, so it's just a matter of <clears throat> being able to take advantage of that. You know, I think we eat up a lot of vacation with like barbecues and, uh, other obligations that we have to do. And by the end of the year, we're like, God, what happened? I didn't do anything with my, with my year, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I've been lucky and yes, it was, it's totally worth it. Um, yeah. We, we, on this show, we actually talked to a lot of people. This is what the, your episode is going to be. It's kind of a life outside the box series where like people just doing things a little differently. And we talked to so many families with like teenagers who are choosing to live full time on the road. Mm. And it seems to be this, you know, kind of renaissance of, people who maybe didn't get the opportunity in their twenties and early thirties to now do it with the family, which seems honestly super daunting to me, but they're making it happen. And there's people we've talked to that's been on the road for like five years with kids and they love it. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's in my future or not, but it's, it's definitely possible even after mm -hmm. that, um, that age where most people think that it's their only chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah. With it. And like, with the kids and you know, I mean, how many memories are, are kids going to have from that period? I don't know, but <clears throat> it's pretty cool. Like it's, it's a great way to see a lot and understand how big the world is, I think for, for one thing. So yeah, you run into people doing that and you're just like, wow, this is something that was not, and you know, my parents were not able to, <laughs> you know, financially we would never been able to do that. Um, or maybe would never so, even want to. Yeah. I wonder, I should ask him about that actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man. So, so, you know, you, you, during all this, you, you get into climbing at some point, you're around the country, you're climbing. Is that kind of your biggest passion in life? Um, that in the work you were doing uh, with the nonprofit? Uh, it was, you know, and I haven't been climbing much for about the last three or four years. Um, it was, yeah, it was like the thing that got me, like gave me my, like what I thought was an identity, you know, when I, when I quit drinking and was like trying to figure out who I was. Um, so yeah, it was amazing. Um, climbed all over the West and a little bit in Europe and, um, Denver's wonderful for that because there's, I think there's 10,000 climbing routes within two hours of downtown Denver. Um, you know, I, I think people think of Boulder as like a climbing city and, or climbing, uh, Mecca and it totally is, but Denver's pretty great if you have to have like, uh, if you can't afford to live in Boulder to be honest, or, uh, or if you're like, you know, your job is here or whatever. Um, so it's really close to a lot of stuff. So you, we were able to, you know, I would go climbing after work some, some days during the summer when it was light out long enough. And, um, yeah, it was really cool. Uh, it taught me how to deal with fear, I think, or maybe not how to deal with it in a very healthy way, but survive it, I guess. Um, and it's a great way to, see places you know i think everybody if you look at it a lot of people have different reasons they travel or different sort of ways they go places you know there's a group of people who um i think they're called the extra milers they try to you know ride on every uh mile of uh amtrak railway um I've never heard of that <laughs> right yeah so and then there's there's people who visit all the state capitals and there's people who try to climb all the state high points and it's like this this way of sort of motivating yourself to get out there and you know climbers see way different parts of the world than other people and uh people who go to comic con you know in different cities see different parts of the world or people who go to visit every baseball stadium or follow fish concerts or whatever you know like that's 
there we're all trying to we all have this little niche that we do uh not all of us some of us have this niche that we do and climbing just became that for me you know where you you get to see different places and <clears throat> cover a little bit of terrain and interact with uh, an environment and yeah it was it was life changing and then just sort of you know when i was kind of like i said i was going to take a break from it i was just kind of sick of being scared all the time when i was out there because i would just kind of do things that were at the edge of my ability which was not high um and i just i started getting into ultra running because that was like i call it all the pain and suffering of mountaineering without the risk of death because people don't usually die doing it um and climbing people die doing it sometimes so so i got into that more and that's what that's kind of what i've been doing the last couple years um pretty regularly you seem to have a, a kind of a love and hate relationship with running too or just everything, yeah. yeah everything, okay. <laughs> really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are what are things we really, really love? You know, ice cream, sure. You know, but even that can be bad for you if, if you get too much of it. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think there's just like a gravity towards doing hard things, you know, um, and that, and trying to find growth through that, maybe. So, whether they're hard physically or mentally, um, you know, it's. It's all sort of the same theme for me. You know, it's, it could be public speaking, which I hate too, but I try to do a lot of to get rid of that fear and get better at it, I guess. So that's interesting. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, traveling to climb. I've always been kind of pondered, uh, perplexed by that. I mean, I, I love to bike pack. I, that's what I've kind of just, <laughs> that was my adventure resume is just bike packing trips. Um, which to me is like, it's a, it's a journey. It's a venture. It's like riding a horse across the West or something or, or like, tra- you know, like a through hike. It, it makes sense to me. Whereas mm-hmm. like destination climbing, like what about, it, it feels to me, cause I'm not much of a climber, um, kind of trapping, like, okay, I travel to be on this rock for like six days, spending time and time doing, you know, practicing these moves or this pitch or on these boulders, I don't know. It's, I guess it doesn't feel that for someone who's really into it, but it has always seemed like that on the outside looking in. Like, ah, oh, you go yeah. there and you're just stuck on this rock for a week. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you're doing. You know, like there's if you're just going to sport climb, you can climb, you know, if you're there for a week, you can climb, you know, 35 routes, yeah, you know, or, yeah. or more. And I feel the same way about when I hear people who are going to Everest or K2. I'm like, oh my God, it's like six, eight weeks of like, and it's all one thing, you know, like if you don't, if you, yeah. And if you don't get to the summit, you, if you're, if you're the type of person who signs up for that, you're probably going to be obsessed with getting to the summit. And like, that's two months of your life, you know, and there's not, it's not like people come back and like, yeah, we didn't summit, but it was really fun. You know, <laughs> I feel like if I was there, I'd be like, yeah, we didn't summit. So now I'm saving money to go back and actually finish it. Uh, but yeah, it seems like a, it seems pretty, pretty weird too, to try to like, like that's your way to travel. But, uh, but yeah, I, I hear you. Um, and I don't know, it's just about, I mean, I've, you know, the, the one, if you spend a day on a multi-pitch climb, you are the, the thing I miss most is just being in a space where nobody else is there. You're on a belay ledge, you know, a few hundred feet above the ground and you're not seeing anybody besides your climbing partner. Birds are flying by a little breeze, maybe some weather's coming in and you have this incredible situation that you can't really replicate in another very, very few other places, I guess, or very few other ways. So that's, that's a cool thing. Um, but yeah, I, bike packing is awesome too. And like, I've done a, a bunch of that and that is, that is literally, I think the best way to travel. Um, especially if you're encountering a lot of people, um, in a lot of different places, like biking, biking across America is like, one of the coolest ways to see the country and get to know people because the bike really takes away any shyness they have about coming up to you and talking to you. Like people will just walk up to you at a gas station and be like, wow, what are you doing? Where are you going? Like, what do you eat? Like how far do you ride each day? And then you get to find out a little bit about their lives in whatever town, you know, even if they've never left like a 20 mile radius of that place, you get to chat with them and find out what life is like there a little bit. And, they, nobody ever comes up to you, you know, if you're in a car at a gas station and like, ah, oh, wow, what kind of car is that? Where are you going? You know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to work. Cool. You know, put yourself on the bike, put a bunch of bags on it. You're going to have friends anywhere you go. You're going to have people mm-hmm. to talk to. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so you've, you've experienced that yourself then. 
Yeah, I, we, I basically across America in 2010 with a buddy, uh, Very San cool. Diego to Florida. So, yeah, and it's it's really, I mean, 11 miles an hour is like the best speed to see everything, you know. I agree, man. Uh, and that, that's a southern southern tier route right mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we want to thank our sponsor, Athletic Brewing, for promoting a healthy lifestyle through making some of the world's best non-alcoholic craft beer. They make excellent tasting NA for healthy, active, modern adults. They use certified all-organic grains, and each can of non-alcoholic beer is only between 50 and 70 calories. They have IPA, golden ale, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings. And recently, they actually just took home the gold medal at the U.S. Open Beer Championships for their Double Hop IPA. If you would like to get your hands on some, you can save 15% by using the code ADVENTURE at athleticbrewing.com. Athletic Brewing, the best tasting way to keep your promises. And also want to thank our sponsor, CS Instant Coffee, for making this show happen. They make 100% Arabica Instant Coffee. They use compostable packaging, and each package makes about 20 ounces of coffee. So I'll take one of those with me on an overnight trip, and it makes two pretty good-sized cups of coffee. And it's an awesome feeling knowing I can just throw that in my backpack, find some hot water, and I'm good to go. Save 20% by using the code ADVENTURE at csinstant.coffee. You're getting in my bread and butter right there, man. I love God. There's, I, I, I'm a huge proponent. I don't think there's a better way to travel. Walking is a little too slow, and I hate not take. I hate just not being able to just chill on the downhills. Like down mm-hmm. a mountain is painful. It, it's mm-hmm. it's drudgery, really. And with the bike, it's like finally this this payoff. And like you said, I, it's something that a lot of people don't expect when they travel by bike is you meet the most interesting people because they're going to be the the ones most most willing to talk to you is the most interesting people in whatever town you're going through and Mm -hmm. you stay in great shape and can eat a bucket of ice cream when you get when you get to your tent at the end of the day exactly yeah lose weight yeah yep (laughs) so where in this journey did you start start writing i know that you had a degree in journalism but where, where did it become more more of what you were doing yeah, the uh, I mean, as one of my classes in for my master's degree was a magazine writing class, and you had to get published um, to pass the class. So um, you can imagine you were trying to get published in like the magazines you'd heard of. But uh, actually, a friend recommended I try to get published in a very small magazine called Idaho Magazine, and I was like 2004, and I was like, okay, I had taken a road trip, just a really quick 36 hour road trip around Idaho, and wrote a piece about that for this magazine and got $40. And the next year, I think my freelance income was $100. Uh, and then the next year is 1200 And then after that, you know, I just kept, I just kept working in my, you know, I had day jobs for what the first five, six, seven, geez, seven years that I was um, trying to be a writer and I would just work in my spare time on these other things that I wanted to try to get, you know, try to, wanted to be published. I wanted to write for climbing magazine and backpacker and outside and all those, all those publications. And at first they're not very receptive to you cause you don't know anything and you're maybe not that good of a writer. Um, so I just kind of kept banging my head against the wall until it started happening. It's a very slow process. Um, so yeah, so it's, I've always been doing it ever since I got, uh, yeah, that's that last semester I was at the university of Montana. Um, what were some of those day jobs? Um, so I worked at newspapers for the first, first three and a half years. I got out of school, one in suburban Phoenix and then one in uh, Denver, you know, it's like sort of weeklies that you didn't feel like anybody was reading. Maybe they were, I don't know. And then after three and a half years of that, I've kind of felt like it wasn't really going anywhere for me or I wasn't really. I wasn't really fit for that type of environment of, it wasn't like, I wasn't like getting to write very much that I wanted to to do. So I ended up going to work for a nonprofit called big city Mountaineers. Um, and I was there for two and a half years and yeah, uh, right before I left there, I got published in climbing magazine for the first time. And then, um, 
I had, I had been working and trying and trying and trying um, and getting gradually a little bit more success the whole time I was there um, writing for smaller adventure publications. So yeah, by the time I left there, I took a job writing copy for IBM uh, for a little over wow, a year. It's a different world. Yeah, I was a, was a friend who connected me and he was just like, this guy can do this and I think he can do this. And yeah, it was a great job. Um, really, it was like, I mean, if I wasn't into adventure writing, I would still be doing that. It, would, it, was, it was a really great thing to be able to do from home, to be honest. But uh, yeah, and as I did that job from home, I was able to just grow the, the side. I did my, started my blog in 2011 and that started growing. And then finally there was enough work where I said, I think I'm going to make a go of it. Uh, and that was 2012, uh, decided to try to do it full time. And for about three or four months, I was kind of not sure if I had made the right decision, not really sure if I was going to have enough money coming in. And then, um, things really started happening after that. And yeah, it was, it was great. So here we are still no, still no full-time job now. So yeah, man, that's, uh, you know, if you can get behind the scenes and see kind of like what we were talking about, what's really going on, it's, it's a grind. It's, it's, you know, people think you've made it, but it, it, it's so, so gradual for most people, for most of us. And with these, you know, jumps, these breaks, but nothing really ever feels like it's, I'm, I've arrived. It's always, I'm no. sure it feels a lot of ways like, you know, day one, like you've, first published in climbing magazine you, you probably felt like i've made it and then you didn't realize it was another you know huge oh, no. struggle yeah. up until where you are today uh, yeah you know your your blog is one of those things i've always read i've never heard it said out loud how do you pronounce it semi-rad or semi-rad whatever you want i, I say i say semi i don't know if that's correct that's not. how i read it in my head semi-rad okay yeah okay. there you go yeah what, what, what does the name come from i just uh was trying to figure out something that celebrated sort of the rest of us who are not climbing 514 and winning uh, races. And sponsored. Yeah, and there was, there was a book called Semi-Tough that I had seen in a bookstore when I was a kid. And I've never read the book still, but I, I just remember the cover. I was like, that's kind of a good combination of words. And Semi-Red is short. It was available on Twitter. You know, um, easy to remember. The URL was available. And uh, it just seemed to capture, like, what I was talking about. So... Um, yeah, it was, I think I bought the URL for 25 bucks in 2011, 2010, late 2010. Yeah. And then just kind of decided I was going to post a blog every week and see what happened. And, um, until I got tired of it or something good happened out of it and it started happening pretty, pretty quickly. Like I would say in the first four or five months, um, people started getting sort of into it and sharing it and making it worth my, my time, I guess. Did that surprise you? Um, yeah, not, I don't know. Not really. I hoped it, I hoped somebody would notice. I mean, it wasn't like, I don't know. You, you never like, I don't think, I think some people have viral success. And for me, it's just been like small, slow growth for years and years and years. Like even, even my Instagram is like, takes forever to, I don't get these like big hits of people very often. It's just like slow, which I think is sustainable growth um, to me where instead of people just discovering you one day, like a million people discovering you, I don't, I don't know that those are fans that will stick around for, for long um, just because, you know, they're like, it's like if you offer free beer at your bar and you have, you know, a thousand people show up on a Saturday, how many of those people are going to come back the next Thursday? You know, like when you don't have free beer, um, that's kind of what I think about it as. Um, so yeah, it's just like, yeah, like it's a grind. A friend of mine compares it to Andy Dufresne digging a tunnel with that geologist hammer in uh, Shawshank Redemption, you know? And I think, I think that's a completely, uh, accurate metaphor for it, you know? Absolutely. Can you dig a can you dig a hole with a spoon? Basically, is what you're talking about. And so. I'm like, well, why would you want to do that? <laughs> but you know, yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, man. I that overnight success is is deadly. I, I love I love basketball, um, the basketball culture. But I see these kids just literally get you know drafted overnight, and they're ruined because they're 18, 19 years old, and immediately treated like they're you know, CEOs of a company 
and yeah. it just totally obliterates their who they are. And I hate that. And that slow, steady growth, uh, yeah, like you said, so much more sustainable. Um, you learn so much more. You know your craft so much better. Um, and honestly, it's probably a lot more rewarding than overnight success. And you get to really be secure in, in the foundation of who you are rather than just being thrown into the spotlight and you know who knows what could happen to you with 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 the money and that much success it'd change anybody yeah it's like lebron uh, it's like one of the few cases of you know big overnight success like that and the, the jury's out on a lot of a lot of people who like lonzo ball i guess would be a good like how is he gonna do um they're so you're so young i just like i think about i was just an idiot when i was 18 you know i was an idiot and i was an idiot until i was 27 i think and you know i can't imagine being having that much success in that short time and yeah my ideals like i look at zion he's like you know supposed to be the next lebron and i just think oh lebron's just god he's such a great example of like a lot of things like wow he's survived the success no scandals no you know seems to be a good dad Mm -hmm. had no figure of a father himself crazy mom yeah god i hope zion survives this man they're just treating him like i mean he's freaking 19 years old i was yeah like you said an idiot what i thought i remember sharing some of my ideals with my dad at 19 and him just thinking you are an idiot I'm like <laughs> that's just what i think is true at the time and looking back it's like yeah that was a pretty stupid thing for me to say but yeah you know how was how was i supposed to know <laughs> Yeah, and we, you didn't even have Twitter. You know, you didn't have like hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter at that point. Yeah, it's it's actually yeah really nice to not have grown up making stupid mistakes like with, that are very visible to the public and screenshotable. You know. Yeah, man. So one thing you know, it, you know, semi rad. I guess it was kind of like a creative outlet with this what seems like a really dry IBM job that you say you know really enjoyed. Um, and it took off semi rad did when did the illustrations be start becoming a thing and, and why why did you move in that mm. direction was that just a unique expression outside of just words that you could share yeah. some ideas some jokes i started do i did a couple flow charts on my blog um which <clears throat> the which became probably a couple of the most viral things i've ever done um like had shared uh, a couple thousand times that that really drove traffic to my website. I think they're probably a couple more of the more popular blog posts I've done, but they also just get stolen. Like people just screenshot them and then put them on their own thing and don't credit you. Um, and they were very low, low tech. Like I literally sat down in a coffee shop and drew one on a piece of like typing paper or printer paper and would take photos of them. They're not even good photos. You can barely read everything. And I sort of, I was kind of like, on Instagram, I was drawing a few charts or just drawings of like things on graph paper um, and in little, you know, like little field notes, notebooks, take a photo of it, post it. And it did OK. And at the same time, I was getting kind of bored with all of our nature photos. It was just like, OK, I don't you know, are we like it's cool when it's just your friends, but you start following more than your friends and you're like, OK, we're just doing I, I just didn't i didn't really it wasn't really capturing my attention anymore and i started following all these new yorker cartoonists and other cartoonists and so then my feed became this just source of laughter for every you know i would scroll through and just be like this is great you know this is like i'm getting to read these jokes on a, on a you know most of my feed is these jokes which is fantastic and i wasn't bored with it anymore oh, i yeah. thought I can't really draw, but maybe I can do like charts, I guess. And so I bought an iPad just to make it a little bit more professional looking and then potentially, you know, have the actual files to be able to, I don't know, print off or make prints of or make t-shirts out of them or something like that. And I mean, to this day, I only know how to use one paintbrush in the program that I use and it's the same thickness and everything is the exact same. And I'm like, this is all I can do really. Um, so it's, I still can't can't draw at all. If I draw something for my blog or, or Instagram, and it looks like I drew it. It's like I traced it. You know, I found a photo on the internet and traced most of it, or, or moved an arm or a leg or something like that. And um, so, yeah, and it just sort of I I think that my sense of being sort of tired of 
the stuff that was out there and like trying to create something fresh sort of maybe grabbed a few people and other people were, you know, when you see that come through your feed, maybe you do pause as opposed to photos of lattes or whatever we're looking at on a daily basis, you know, cause I still, still have a normal feed, you know, where there's a lot of stuff that I do see what my friends are doing in the outdoors and it's cool, but it's, it's much, it's probably half of what I see. And I like the other stuff too, cause it makes me think more uh, and laugh more. Um, Cause it's, you can't really make a, a photo that funny to a general audience. You know, if you, yeah, you can in a caption maybe, but uh, it's the, the visual joke is so quick to deliver. Um, so it's been, I've been learning as I go and you know, what works and what doesn't and what I'm good at and what I'm really terrible at and should never do again. Um, so yeah, it's been fun. And that's the same thing. It's like very slow growth and still, I see a lot of other people who have the same sort of accounts where they draw stuff and um, whether they're objectively better or worse than mine, I don't know, but um, I think they post more and see more growth out of it. And I just don't have time to do a post every single day, which is what the Instagram algorithm rewards. I like, I do like three a week and like, that's my limit and I'm okay with that. You know, it's like, I can't really be like trying to come up with seven drawings a week for, for no money, you know? Um, so it's, it's been super fun though. Like it's, I think if people find out about me nowadays, it's probably through that. So it's getting harder and harder to get people to read anything that takes more than 10 seconds, which is a shame, but that's, that's the way the world is right now, I guess. That instant gratification. I know when I scroll yeah. through my feed, I'm, I, I, I enjoy seeing anything from you, from the onion, follow oh, yeah. a couple other just joke, you know stuff some mm -hmm. basketball stuff and then just tons and tons of pictures of photoshop landscapes with beautiful women you know facing away from the camera i mean can can we have any more of that it's kind of like when you go in or i don't know what it was about this summer but i was like can anyone else make a water bottle here like there's 400 companies selling colored water bottles how is there well, a market for all these people <laughs> and then I, I think about the same way with these instagram models and I, so, so when I am scrolling, I, I, I can, you know, obviously your stuff is branded. It's that yellow, um, that yellow title box mm -hmm. with some, you know, primary colors and a white background. It's, it catches your attention for sure. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to make people laugh. Right. And like, I guess that's, or think a little bit. So hopefully that happens. And yeah. I don't know. It's, it's such a hard thing to. Yeah, water bottles. What a market to break into. I mean, that would be tough, right? And then you have overhead too. You're yeah. like, we're going to make these water bottles and then try to sell them. Or I don't know how that stuff works. It's terrifying to me. And like oh, yeah. buying, buying an iPad is very low, um, very low commitment. You know, if this doesn't work out, I can just watch movies on this thing on planes or read, you know, Kindle books or whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, that's fine. And so I, I think that's another thing that people appreciate is your it seems like, you know, yeah, because I know you have a really long-standing relationship with, like, um, outdoor research. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems a lot of this is just kind of not, I'm not going to say come into your lab, because I know you're not, I know you're working really hard, but you're also not, it almost seems like you don't have an obsessed view of what this is supposed to be, and I'm going to get there no matter what. It's kind of like, let's see what mm -hmm. happens, let's see what works and what doesn't, but I'm flexible for you know, what this looks like in the future and, and what kind of takes off and what, what doesn't. Oh man. I think, I think you kind of have to be like that nowadays. Like you kind of have to be able to pivot and evolve because everything is evolving so quickly. You know, like we've already social media platforms that have like become huge and then gone away, you know, like they're, they're no more. So you kind of have to either diversify or, you know, think about how can this work in a different format that people will, actually like or how do you stay relevant i guess and my my favorite seth godin quote is something to the effect of start small start now you can always go big later um, and it's you know it's it that's the way i've sort of done everything like a small thing frequently on a regular basis and then you look back a year later and you're like wow that became something you know um that's a thing as opposed to you know, sometimes people will say we're launching this today and I'm like, I have not had success launching anything. You know, it's like, it's not so much a launch as you're like pushing the car to get it started, you know, on a downhill and then 
it starts and then it starts rolling. You know, it's like, it's such a slow growth for everything for me. And, um, the, the word launch doesn't really work in my, in my, the way I do things, I guess. So I don't know. I don't know. I think people have different, uh, different resources too, where they can launch something and it's like they have contacts or friends who are a big deal and that can help you launch something. And I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, this is, I'm doing this thing right now. It's a little, uh, if you like it, share it. And you know, the people who like your stuff will share it with their friends and maybe they don't have 5 million followers, but maybe they have 200 and maybe three of those people like it and they'll share it with their hundred followers or whatever. And you know, it's like, it's so sort of a slower, smaller way to do that. But yeah, it's, I just, I don't know how to do, I know how to grind, I guess. And that's, that's the, the best way I can do it. Um, yeah. Got this grit. You just keep going. And, you know, I think I, a lot of people could learn that, um, from you, but, you know, I know there's no way to predict what this is going to be, what semi-rad um, from Instagram or the blog is going to be 10 years from now. But what what do you hope it becomes? <laughs> Boy, if I'm alive 10 years from now, I'll be psyched. And, uh, if the, I don't know what. I mean, I have no idea. Like t- you will two years. What, what do you hope? Two years. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope I can, uh, I hope I can keep doing it and people are still getting something out of it, I guess, you know, and. I have other projects, book projects and stuff that I'd like to do. Um, but yeah, I just, I just hope, uh, I can keep helping people get through life, I guess, with a laugh or maybe sit back in their desk chair and say, Hmm, I never thought about that, you know, and, and think about things in a slightly different way. Um, generally you just want to help people. I think, you know, like live a better life in a, in a very small way, you know, you talk about the things that change your life in a huge way. And there's a lot of them, but like there's a lot of things that change your life in a very small way that are very, are extremely helpful over time. You know, this like one degree shift in, in your uh, direction that came about because of something you read or something you heard or something you saw. And like, if I can be one of those things for a few people, that's, that's pretty great life, I guess. I mean, if that's your aspirations and, and that's what you're going after, I, I think that's, that's a very realistic way to look at what you actually can do. Yeah. You know, if you went around saying, you know, I want to change people's lives forever and have this moment where they say, what is the greatest thing you've ever experienced meeting and hearing from Brendan Leonard? <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, that's God, a lot. That's a lot to shoot for. <laughs> you just need, you need higher standards if that, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you can do better than that. Yeah. That's funny. Well, well for, for a guy from Iowa, who lived out in Montana and is a climber, you make a ton, a ton of like nineties rap references. Oh yeah. What's that about? That was my music when I was growing up, man. I like sort of discovered public enemy when I was, God, was I like 11 maybe? Um, and it was just this, I think it's probably the same way people relate to like, I don't know, like Harry Potter even. You know, it's like, it was this world you have no access to in rural Iowa. And these people who are telling these stories about it in this sort of aggressive, but very poetic way. And like, you know, the sound of the music was just incredible, you know, and it was all this stuff that was recycled records from, you know, blues, jazz, you know, funk. Um, And it's just, it's a very rich music and I still dig through and like find stuff I didn't know about. And, um, yeah, I was just, that was what I listened to and it got me through, you know, adolescence. And I think your relationship to that, the music that you listened to when you were teenagers never goes away and you don't really have much stronger than that. So yeah, I mean, I've just been like, I am like an amateur hip hop historian to be honest with you at this point. Um, and that's like my one thing that I've never figured out how to make that into some sort of art form where I give back to the art form that changed my life. But, uh, I would like to, but, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. It's, it's so fun being like my age and you realize that people are writing history books about the music you listen to. But at the time people were like, this is a fad. It's nothing, you know, it's like, whatever, that stuff's garbage. And you're like, no, it's important. And, now it's, you know, you're going back and you're like, yeah, look at this, look at this 400 page book about this part of my life, you know, that, that I shared with a bunch of other people. So yeah, I mean, that's, I still, 
now I'm to the point where I'm like buying 12 inch singles from 1991 paying like 40 bucks for them. And like, is this really, is this really what I want to do with my money? And it's, it's tough to not do it. So, yeah. Any rappers you you're into that are more current? Um, you're carrying on that, uh, kind of that same thread. Um, not really. I'm learning to, uh, I'm learning to find MCs where I pick up a couple songs and that I'm like into them. But, you know, it's also rap has become pop music, you know, I, like, so it's changed a lot because the things that succeed in pop music are, um, less complicated, I guess I would say. So there's a lot of like the, the things that are hits right now for rappers are very, very simplified, very like, um, very hook driven. And, um, that stuff doesn't really speak to me, but those guys are not making music for 40 year old dudes, you know, they're making it for young people. So, and also it's like, you know, I talked to a friend of mine, a younger friend of mine is in college and I'm like, does everybody, you know, like who's into hip hop now listen to Kendrick Lamar? And he goes, Oh, I think everybody just listens to Kendrick. Like it doesn't matter if you're into hip hop or not. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. So, um, but yeah, occasionally there's some, there's some, uh, young guys who I pick up on that are really, I'm really into, but I always find they're not really that successful. Like one of my favorite MCs I've heard in the last five years, this guy named Astro, which I think he just shortened his, shortened his name to, to Stro. And I'm like, why is this guy not successful? I'm like, no, oh, I know why, you know, but it's good, you know? So that's interesting. I just remember, you know, following you a while back a few years ago and then seeing your first reference. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> like, where did that, where'd that come from? Out of, from? No, out of nowhere. Like, yeah. I think it was like Rick, Ross, uh, Rick Ross's calendar or something, something about hustling. And I was like, yeah, was he talking man, for real? I thought this guy was just like out in the mountains. Didn't know anything about that, <laughs> but oh, there's a surprise. There's a lot of people who actually have that same, uh, musical, tastes that are the sort of mountain people as well you know and I don't know if it's, yeah it's, and it's not just for the irony oh yeah i think no i think it's i think it spoke to so many people um because we were the generation that that yo mtv raps reached in the suburbs and the mm-hmm. anybody anybody who had cable could access hip-hop and like once you see the visual of it as well you're like wow this is just like being able to travel you know um without without traveling so yeah so, so you know you're you've kind of got your hands in all sorts of things and i want to ask you just as we close just about your new book coming out um about um bears don't care about your problems is that the name of it Did I get yeah that right <laughs> yeah so what is that about what what is uh so is it it's about a, bears <laughs> Well, that's, that's the, so it's a collection of 80, 80 blogs that were very, that were the most successful or best known from my blog for the last eight years. So, and the, the, one of the essays that's in there is called bears don't care about your problems. So we titled the book that and, um, seemed to be, seemed to be a good one. Um, and yeah, it comes out August 1st and it's, I just went through and, you know, kind of looked at what people liked and what I liked and put all the, uh, essays in a book for, for the most part, which is, for the most part, it's chronological starts at the beginning and ends, uh, more recently. Um, but Mountaineers books, uh, decided to publish it and it's, yeah, it'll be out in a couple of weeks here. And we did a, a little book trailer, which is a live reading of that title essay, um, on a stage, uh, with my wife in a bear costume, uh, next to me, um, in a rented smelly bear costume. Uh, but yeah, it's, I'm excited for it to come out. It's sort of this way of like, you know, nobody's going to scroll back through eight years of blog posts and read all of them. If they do, I would really suggest they get another hobby, but if you can compile the best of the best of from, from eight years, that's, that's a cool way to put it in book form, you know? And it, it also becomes this thing that's permanent compared to the internet. We don't, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. It's easy to get lost. So, um, it's, it's a cool way of saying, Hey, this became a thing, you know, and here's the best parts of it. Awesome. And where can people find that? Uh, anywhere it's on Amazon right now for pre-order and any, any bookstore, um, can, can order it for you. I think it'll be at like tattered cover in Denver and, uh, in a few weeks. Um, yeah. 
Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your, your usual suspects. So, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> now, now, do you mind sharing just quickly, you know, what you do day to day? What's, what's one of the hardest aspects for you of what you do and what's something that just surprisingly comes very easily? Oh man. Um, I think the hardest thing right now is that I've been doing this for eight and a half years to, to come up with something that is up to those quote unquote standards, you know, is like, you're kind of, you kind of have standards for yourself. You're like, is this going to succeed? Will people like this? Uh, when you, when you write a piece and yeah, I have to I have a deadline at, you know, midnight tonight, I have to meet with my blog this week. So, um, cause it goes on outside magazines website now too. So I send them the, the copy and then it goes up on Thursday on my site and their site. And you kind of have to think, okay, how's this going to go over? And is this quality and your, your definition of quality just keeps rising. So some weeks it's like something that comes to you when you're out, like taking your dog for a walk. You're like That's brilliant. That'll be great. And then some weeks it's just, yeah, it's like lifting weights, you know, to make something. So I don't know if it ever comes easy. But, but yeah, it's, what's really easy is checking the stats when it, when it goes up I'm like, Oh, are people liking this? You know, it's like the best part. Yeah. It's a little addicting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's uh, I, and I'm sure it is hard when you think something's really good and it, maybe it doesn't resonate with people. I know yeah. with this show, I'm really surprised by what takes off. I'm like, Oh my God, I've been wanting to interview this person for years. It's up. It's going to just blow up and people don't like it. And then some random interview I didn't even put any time in, people loved. God, you have no idea, right? You think you do, and then it's just like, oh, that, okay, all right, I guess. But you're you're always you're always learning, right? You're just learning as you go, still. So no matter what. Well, you know, Brandon, I I appreciate it. Now you got some uh, mulch to move for your wife, and she's apparently very supportive to put on a rented dirty bear costume for you. Um, I see that on your feed. Um, so I don't want to keep you from her, but yeah, thanks for doing this. Thanks for just letting us look kind of what's behind the scenes for somebody who's, you know, trying to make it in this unique way in the outdoor industry. And, uh, yeah, congrats on everything you've done that's successful. And I hope it just continues to grow for you in whatever way that river seems to go. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no problem. All right, man. Well, have a good one. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes, share us on social media, tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash Podcast. And if you know somebody that would make a good guest, reach out. We're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now. Athletic Brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer. Go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15% on your first order. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, Go to BackpackTribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.